Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome API Senior Vice President of Communications, Megan Bloomgren. Good afternoon. On behalf of the entire API team and our membership, thank you for joining us for the 2020 State of American Energy event, the first of an exciting new decade for this industry. We are thrilled today to spotlight American energy leadership and progress in communities across the country and the 10.9 million jobs that are supported by American energy development, transportation, refining, and export. My role today is pretty straightforward. I'm here to welcome the record 800 of you that are with us in person today. We're proud to announce that that's double the attendance of last year's event. I'd also like to welcome the hundreds more that are joining us via live stream at api.org. I'll give you a quick, right? Come on, Kenny G. I'll also give you a sneak peek of the program and share some reminders. But first, in the spirit of the natural gas and oil industry's commitment to safety, and because API literally sets the standards for the highest quality operations around the world, we'll begin our event today with a safety moment. There are no planned emergency drills here at the Anthem today, so please treat any announcement as if it's the real thing. With that in mind, it's always a good idea to be prepared. So the best exit is the one from which you entered back here on my right, and there are additional exits to my left right up front and also in the back of the room. I'd now like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests, including members of Congress, administration officials, industry leaders, labor leaders, trade association executives, and other partners and allies. Join me in welcoming many of these guests. You'll see some others on the screen behind me, and thank you for holding your applause until the end. Today, we welcome Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher from Texas's 7th District and Congressman Michael Burgess from the state's 26th District. Thanks for being here. We welcome senior officials from the Departments of Energy, Labor, the Interior, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We welcome senior officials from the Senate Committees on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, Energy and Natural Resources, Environment and Public Works, finance, and small business and entrepreneurship. We also welcome those from House Committees on Energy and Commerce, Foreign Affairs, Natural Resources, Small Business, Science, Space, and Technology, Transportation and Infrastructure, and the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. With us today are representatives from Senate and House Leadership Offices, thanks for being here, and from the embassies of Canada and Norway. We welcome industry leaders, including Pierre Bang, President and CEO of Total EMP USA, Geraldine Slattery, President of Petroleum Operations from BHP, Brian Kaufman, hey Brian, the President and CEO of Motiva Enterprises, Kevin Nichols, CEO of Shell Midstream Partners, Ryan Flynn from the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association, hey Ryan, Paul Ulrich, Chairman of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Finally, we welcome labor leaders and other industry allies, including Sean McGarvey, president of North America's Building Trades Union, and also a Philadelphia native. Lonnie Stevenson, international president uh, of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Eric Dean, the general president of Iron Workers International. Terry O'Sullivan, the general president of the Laborers International Union, who will also be on our panel shortly on the future of energy. Paula Glover, president and CEO of the American Association of Blacks in Energy. David Hinson, President and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Hello to David. Jose Perez, Chairman and CEO of Hispanics in Energy. Madeline Mielke, President and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. And finally, our celebrity guest today, Mike Rowe, TV host, narrator, and author, who will also take part in our panel discussion today. Thank you all for being here, including the many trade association executives you saw recognized behind me. This year's State of American Energy report features communities that are benefiting from American energy leadership. As you'll hear today, American energy is delivering progress in energy producing and non-producing regions alike. We're happy to have with us special guests over here from these communities, and they're profiled in the reports that were on your seat as you came in. If you could, gang, please rise to be recognized. From Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 
Terry Hayden, president of the Wisconsin Pipe Trades Association from Lansing, Michigan. <laughs> Jennifer Van Dyke, co-owner of Swan Electric. From Moon Township, Pennsylvania, Sam DeMarco, Allegheny County Councilman at Large. Woohoo! From neighboring Butler County, or Butler, Pennsylvania, Jeff Hunter, president and CEO of Hunter Truck, whose company bet on this industry needing a heck of a lot of trucks in western Pennsylvania, and that's a bet that paid off. So see page 11 of your report. From Suffolk, Virginia, Donnie Mills, president of Mills Marine and Ship Repair. From nearby Virginia Beach, Esmel Meeks, executive director of Citizens for Energy Equity. And from Las Cruces, New Mexico, Alec Gorsuch, chief technology officer of HTRAP-1, a pipeline manufacturer. Hey, Alex. Thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come to Washington today. You may even see some snow. Before I retreat, I have three quick requests and a reminder. First, can everybody take out their cell phones, which I'm sure are very close to you, and open up Twitter. We invite everyone to follow at API Energy and tweet or retweet content using the hashtags SOAE2020 and Energy for Progress. Second request, on your table are some question cards um, for our panelists later in the program. So if you could, take a moment now to write a policy-related question or a question about the future of energy for our panelists. We'll have uh, a number of folks coming around and collecting those just before and during that panel discussion. And finally, in a few moments, take a look at these video monitors, which are kind of hard to miss, um, uh, and you'll see a sneak peek of the seven communities that make us proud to tell you about Energy for Progress today. So with that, thank you, and please enjoy your lunch. This is Nancy, Executive Vice President of Hunter Truck, making connections right here in Moon Township. Because when shale boomed, so did Nancy's business. Natural gas and oil helped her to save costs, accelerate repairs, and meet new demands. And with American energy, development is safer and easier. Growth is happening here, and Nancy is in the driver's seat. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Terry, a lifelong citizen of Eau Claire. Today, he's the president of Wisconsin Pipe Trades Association. As a leader of a union that's a vital part of the energy supply chain, he's seen the benefits of natural gas and oil across all of Wisconsin, bringing good paying jobs and fulfilling careers to 9,000 statewide workers. Local pride goes farther here, and Terry is living it out. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Anne, a steam fitter journeywoman powering big time projects. From hospitals to schools to office buildings, Anne's job and the thousands of men and women in the Moon Township Steam Fitters Union were facing a downturn. But thanks to natural gas and oil, new opportunities are attracting bright minds for the long term. Jobs are happening right here, helping people like Anne thrive. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Jim, a director at Red Wing Shoes, a company that's been providing shoes to citizens, soldiers, and everyone in between since 1905. And today, Jim is using natural gas and oil to preserve a local brand with global scale, capturing the grit and determination of small town America. International impact is happening here, and Jim is leaving his footprint. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Sue, a construction contractor right here in Las Cruces. As a business and community leader, Sue is forging relationships that build new infrastructure, repair roadways and utilities, and ensure all this work keeps New Mexico beautiful. Natural gas and oil is helping new business and valued experience intersect. Progress is happening here, and Sue is part of the team. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress.
This is Jim, president of Virginia Natural Gas. And he's focused on using clean energy to power Virginia Beach, reducing electricity rates while bringing jobs and manufacturing to his community and helping make our emissions lower and air cleaner. Beach days are happening here, and Jim is working to ensure they're here to stay. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Brian. He works at Extraction Oil and Gas, a company committed to responsible energy development in their community. And thanks to their support of the Weld Food Bank, monthly trips by the Mobile Food Pantry are possible, all while doing their part to support the 232,000 energy jobs in Colorado. Community businesses are thriving here, and Brian is helping them give back. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Esmel. He's a community organizer with a lot of his own energy, helping community leaders, residents, and small businesses understand what natural gas and oil make possible. From saving money every month on your natural gas bill to powering an entire city, progress is happening here, and Esmel is working to ensure that happens for everyone. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Kevin, President and CEO of Aurora's Chamber of Commerce. An Aurora citizen for 40 years, Kevin has seen natural gas and oil energize his community. Like harnessing the energy reserves needed to build 60,000 homes, Kevin recognizes American energy has been vital to sustaining community growth. Progress is happening here, and Kevin knows it's just getting started. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. This is Donnie, president of Mills Marine and Ship Repair. He's bringing real jobs to Virginia Beach. And with natural gas and oil, he's providing career opportunities that change lives forever. By partnering with universities, nonprofits, and shipyards to keep Virginia Beach a place where local manufacturing can thrive. Opportunity is happening here, and Donnie is bringing it to the community. This is natural gas and oil. This is energy progress. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Je me sens seule sans toi. Je me sens vide sans toi. Penses-tu à moi J'ai tellement besoin de toi. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the main stage screens. This intolerable dependence on foreign oil is a clear and present danger to our nation. I'm determined our national economy will never again be held captive, that we will not return to the days of gas lines and international humiliation. There is no security for the United States in further dependence on foreign oil. I have repeatedly called in this campaign for more energy independence for America, for more reliance on American natural gas. I urge Congress to pass legislation that makes America more secure and less dependent on foreign energy. After years of talking about it, we're finally poised to control our own energy future. The United States is now the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome API President and CEO, Mike Summers. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the State of American Energy at the Anthem. This is quite a different venue from the Reagan Building downtown, where we've done previous State of American Energy events. Being here on stage, on the very spot where Bob Dylan has played, gives this event a whole different feel. Like the best musicians, Americans embrace independence. You see it when we visit our polling places, when we celebrate our freedoms, and now at long last, when we get our energy right here at home. <laughs> Reducing our nation's dependence on foreign energy was the stated goal of every one of our last seven presidents, Democrat and Republican. These leaders all understood that clean, affordable, and reliable American energy served both as the basis of economic growth here at home and security abroad. Now, finally, the United States has achieved this bipartisan goal. The state of American energy in 2020 is one of leadership. America is the global leader in energy development, carbon emissions reductions, and environmental performance. So today, I'm here to talk about three things. One, how America's energy revolution has benefited Americans and the communities that we live in. Two, the risks of climate change and how our industry of problem solvers are meeting the challenge. And three, the choice that is ahead of us and the repercussions that will come if we choose the wrong path. U.S. energy leadership offers stability in chaotic times and insulates America from hostile and unreliable suppliers of energy. The global benefits of American natural gas and oil on the international stage are compelling. But if you want to know the true value of energy leadership in 2020, you must also zoom in to see its benefits here at home. They're on display from the smallest American communities to our biggest cities. American energy is powering the lives of people across our nation. Today, we are introducing you to men and women from seven American communities. You learned about some of these leaders during lunch, and you'll hear more about them later today. Their stories are different, but their experiences are similar. American energy is helping revive their communities. From Colorado and New Mexico to Ohio and Pennsylvania, 
Natural gas and oil development is energizing economies and improving millions of lives. In New Mexico, natural gas fuels the state's economy and future generations to the tune of $1 billion every year for state schools. Natural gas and oil help explain why, in parts of America that haven't seen job growth for decades, you'll now see vibrant manufacturing, people moving in, Main Street's busy again, businesses opening and hiring, and more tax revenue for schools, police, public work, and, co and conservation, and so much more that powers modern life. I've had the chance to visit some of these communities in New Mexico, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania. And when people in those areas think of natural gas and oil, they think of real and ongoing changes for the better. Good paying jobs, lower costs, worker safety, and reliable energy. For example, a local Michigan community leader told us that energy infrastructure brought growth and helped convince U.S. automakers to stay in this country. But these remarkable achievements were no accident. They were brought about by the technologies and practices that unlocked these vast energy resources. Hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling may be a mouthful, but they're as important as the invention of the iPhone. Thanks to fracking, America's net foreign energy imports have plummeted. And the US today is a net exporter of natural gas and oil for the first time in 70 years. America is also leading on emission reductions. No nation on Earth has reduced annual carbon emissions more than we have. And we have the capacity, desire, and grit to keep stepping up. The American people rightly expect big things from this industry. We have to serve the vast and growing demand for affordable energy, and we have to accelerate progress on the serious challenge of climate change. Any report on the state of industry should begin with that fact that we accept that calling and that we are meeting it. Every day, our industry is focused on lowering emissions, on increasing efficiency, and on furthering our environmental progress. The size and scope of the climate challenge requires a tremendous response. And it requires innovation from everyone, including our members. Bold and achievable action on climate change at the global level is essential. And America's natural gas and oil industry is committed to innovation and leadership to make those ambitions more than just hopes and dreams. We support legislation to encourage wider use of carbon capture, utilization, and storage technology, a breakthrough based on American ingenuity. We're partnering with the best minds in technology, data analytics, and engineering. We proudly launch, launched the Environmental Partnership two years ago to convene, share, and design new methods for reducing methane emissions. Whenever we advance new technologies to reduce or capture carbon emissions, we take a step forward with other industries looking to do the same. But our industry's problem solvers are not done yet. Our industry now supports 10.9 million jobs and we're charging ahead. When facing serious challenges, you want the capable men and women of America's natural gas and oil industry on your side. When API advocates for energy development and infrastructure, we're fighting for the long-term success of American communities like the seven that are represented here today, and so many more like them. No one should take away what they've gained and worked for. No one should close them off from even more opportunities ahead. What's happening with American energy today is one of the greatest economic success stories of our time, and it's in America's interest to keep it going. To do that, we must continually develop new and affordable, reliable energy. That powers America's economic growth 
and we need new infrastructure over the next 15 years. America needs an estimated $1 trillion in private infrastructure development to bring energy from where it is to where it isn't. To help unlock our critical funding, our lawmakers need to adopt new guidelines to protect the environment, cut red tape, and avoid unnecessary delays. All this only helps strengthen our economy on both ends of the value chain. It ensures our abundant energy powers American households, businesses, and trading partners, and communities like those I just mentioned. We need lawmakers to end mandates on ethanol that were put in place long ago when our energy picture was much different. We also need to ensure ongoing access for safe and responsible energy development on land and offshore. We strongly support the USMCA trade deal that was approved by the House last month. It holds immense potential for our country and for our closest neighbors. Yet some other trade efforts, such as tariffs against China and other nations, take our country in the wrong direction. While unfair trade practices must be addressed, trade wars block American progress. De-escalation is, of course, welcome news. But American policymakers must get us over the finish line. Let's remove all trade barriers on both sides and restore critical energy export growth. When we speak up on issues like these, we are taking the side of the workers in these communities. And we're taking the side of all sectors of the economy that depend on the breadth, progress, and strength of US oil and natural gas. Somehow, at this very moment of progress, some have made it their cause to stop American energy development. At the extreme, we hear promises on the 2020 campaign trail to ban fracking nationwide and forever. Here's a glimpse of that vision. Millions of jobs lost, a spike in household energy costs, a manufacturing downturn, less energy security. In the short run, a fracking ban would click quickly invite a global recession. You don't abolish the most dynamic asset of the world's leading energy producer without severe consequences. It's no mystery why foreign leaders hostile to American interests don't like America's energy progress and the advantage it has given to our country. Other countries now have the choice of reliable energy from the U.S., thanks in part to sound policy and the American innovation of fracking. Banning a safe, and successful method of developing energy is just part of an extreme agenda opposed to natural gas and oil, no matter where it is produced. Nobody wants unhindered development on, or drilling on all federal lands. That's an extreme view that exists only as a tired caricature of our industry. So in this campaign year, in bids to capture fleeting political momentum, we'll hear pledges to ban development on all federal lands, onshore and offshore. I don't for one moment believe that there's a majority in either party for that position, but I don't believe in taking things for granted either. So together, we must all strongly oppose these proposals. Whether the issue is offshore leases, fracking, or energy infrastructure, the false choices will prevail by default unless we answer directly with evidence, sharing our stories and those from communities across our country to drive the conversation. The American people make their own choices. And we should all remember, after all, that there's another word for choice when it comes to energy. It's called demand. The nation with the largest and most innovative economy in the world runs on affordable, reliable energy the majority of which comes from natural gas and oil. Our mission as an industry starts with meeting that rising demand and doing it responsibly. We are relentless in finding and producing affordable energy and just as persistent in reducing our environmental footprint, improving safety technology, and decreasing emission rates. 
but we're not finished. API in this industry will continue to lead far and wide. Today, US energy development is safer than it's ever been, in part thanks to API's world-class standards. From foundational offshore safety to pipeline leak detection, API standards drive safety, environmental protection, and sustainability, not only here in the United States, but across the world. In fact, setting standards for the natural gas and oil operations has been the core program of API since our inception. And in our first 100 years, we've adopted more than 100 standards. In 2019 alone, API released seven, or 90 standards that we've introduced, and, and we've introduced our best-in-class practices for developing natural gas and oil markets, both in Guyana and Nigeria. We also signed agreements with our counterparts in India, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, so that producers and government agencies in these regions can rely on our standards and programs to drive safe operations. Shortly, you'll hear from a panel about just how far our efforts reach, even in regions that don't produce natural gas or oil. It's a reminder that our impact extends far beyond that of any single industry or group. Every citizen stands to gain when energy is more affordable and produced cleaner here in the United States. Our energy future can unite Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike. And that is the spirit of everything we do at API. It's clear that these issues won't be solved on social media, in floor speeches, or with political pledges. These pledges promise a lot, but they deliver very little. It takes hard work to develop affordable solutions to meet demand for cleaner energy while addressing the risks of climate change. But together, we can do it. Wherever the future of energy is at stake, whenever people doubt the value of natural gas and oil, wherever our commitment to worker safety and environmental safety is questioned, you're going to see API making our case. We're ready to work together. We may not agree on every detail, but on the big issues, we have far more in common than you may think. Like our nation, this industry finds itself at a defining moment, one where energy demands have never been higher and the focus on cl a cleaner planet has never been greater. We're eager to accelerate our work together to tackle both challenges, and we intend to spend the next 100 years continuing to innovate to create a better future for all of us. Our industry's mission is society's mission. That's energy for progress. Thank you very much. Get up. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome community leaders from across America for a special message. Good afternoon. I'm Allegheny County Councilman Sam DeMarco from Western Pennsylvania, better known as shale country. This is the region that provides much of the energy that's making our country stronger and more self-reliant. Tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians and their families are enjoying the jobs and the safety and comfort that this industry is bringing due to its development this past decade. I'm Jennifer Van Dyke from Lansing, Michigan. I'm president of Swan Electric Company. We have seen large energy infrastructure projects that have provided immense benefit not only to our, uh, our business, but to the greater Lansing community. And I'm Terry Hayden from Wisconsin. 
Natural gas and oil are providing incredible work opportunities for the men and women of my union. I, I, my hometown is Eau Claire, and it's a great place to, to raise a family and to live. And because of American Energy, we have more than 18,000 students currently enrolled in programs to supply our area's demand for skilled workers. And I'm Esmo Meeks from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Affordable energy costs help every American family and create good paying jobs. I'm proud of my part in telling this story. The video you're about to watch is about progress in my community and others all across America, all made possible by American natural gas and oil. Thank you. It's not always obvious. With everything going on, it's easy to take it for granted. But if you look closely, you'll find that natural gas and oil is at work for you, bringing real benefits to people and communities across America. The majority of our energy relies on natural gas. Overall, it really has improved our community's quality of life. Every day, we're looking for ways to do it better. It's a huge natural gas revolution going on out there. I think the energy costs going down have helped. What can we do to adjust what we're doing to maintain our lower costs? Creating a future that is. Building a more resilient America. Delivering opportunity. Strengthening local economies. And ensuring a cleaner future. Demand for a cleaner energy is only increasing. And challenges this size require unmatched problem solving, innovation, and policymaking. What happens in Washington and in state capitals across the U.S. can either accelerate or undermine this great progress in our towns and neighborhoods. We must meet demands with reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy. Creating a brighter tomorrow while continuing energy progress today. Join us in strengthening American communities. Learn more at energyforprogress.org. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Future of Energy panelists. General President of Laborers International Union of North America, Terry O'Sullivan. President and CEO of Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, Karen Kerrigan. President of Petroleum Equipment and Services Association, Leslie Beyer. Skilled trades advocate and television host, Mike Rowe. And our panel moderator, API Senior Vice President of Global Industry Services, Deborah Phillips. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deborah Phillips, and I run a part of API that Mike and Megan have mentioned earlier today, but not many in this town know very much about are more than 120 employees and more than 7,000 volunteers worldwide develop standards and programs that drive safety, environmental performance, sustainability, and energy efficiency throughout the oil and gas industry, both here domestically and around the world. And it's my distinct pleasure to be the moderator for today's panel. I'm joined on stage um, with four folks that have unique um, and well-positioned perspectives regarding America's energy future and they're here to um, share that with us today. Just um, to do a brief uh, reintroduction of our panelists, we have Terry O'Sullivan um, at the end to your left, representing International Labor's Union. Uh, we've got Karen Kerrigan, representing small businesses and entrepreneurs. Next to Karen, we have Leslie Beyer, who represents companies that provide critical equipment and services to the oil and gas industry worldwide. And our celebrity guest, Mike Rowe, um, who, of course, you, you know probably well from Dirty Jobs, but is also um, a, a skilled trades advocate here in this country. So we don't have much time. I'm going to jump right in. And Karen, uh, you get the first question. Um, you represent small companies and entrepreneurs, and you don't always immediately think about energy and oil and gas in terms of the interest, the primary interest of your organization. So can you talk a little bit about why energy is so important to your companies, and as you look toward the future, what's on their minds? Yeah, well, a lot's on their mind given the you know, competitive global economy, but we, um, SBE Council, always makes uh, uh, the point, um, a big point, um, about underscoring the role um, of entrepreneurs and small businesses 
in the oil and natural gas industry. They actually dominate this industry. And you know, US, uh, US energy has been uh, a long-term, consistent, good news, economic story, and small businesses have benefited from that, both as consumers in the marketplace, but also as entrepreneurs and small businesses um, in the industry. So, um, for example, among oil and, and gas um, extraction companies, 90% uh, uh, have fewer than 20 employees. 96% um, have you know fewer than 100. Um, oil and gas drilling companies numbers are the same. About 96% or so are fewer than 100. 8% have fewer than 20 employees. So all sectors, whether it's equipment, manufacturing, um, pipeline construction, and related structures, you name it. It's really small businesses that are driving uh, innovation uh, in this industry. And I love seeing um, all the, uh, the videos of the women entrepreneurs uh, in this industry. Um, obviously, women entrepreneurship is booming. And to have the opportunity for women uh, to uh, engage in this industry, bring more diversity in this, in this industry is very uh, important. Uh, innovation, I mean, diversity fuels innovation which will only help in terms of you know, taking our industry, um, the energy industry, to the next level. So, um, and making it more affordable. And with respect to cost, I mean, I think that's the big thing, right? For, for any business, but for small businesses, to have this consistent, um, uh, to not, you know, when we think about 15 years ago and you know, when we were up on the hill, talking about the concern that small business owners have uh, about price shocks you know, to their bottom line. To have stable and consistent costs is so important for small businesses in terms of allowing them to invest, to compete, to hire, I mean, do all the things that they do uh, to keep our economy growing. So um, it's, it, it's vital, you know, obviously I love Mike's points about the policies to encourage the industry, but it is entrepreneurs and small businesses really at the heart of the industry and are helping to strengthen it as well not only the industry, but really the engine of the American economy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Terry, um, you're, you're, you're next. Um, good paying, middle class jobs are really the lifeblood of your membership. And we've heard stories today about opportunities that the new um, energy age in America has brought to communities and individuals. Can you talk a little bit about what it's meant for your membership? And as you look forward, um, what are the policies that are necessary to sustain those kinds of opportunities and potentially expand them? I want to first thank you, Deborah. I first want to thank Mike Summers and API for the invitation on behalf of our organization. We have a great partnership and relationship with API and your member firm, so thank you on behalf of the 510,000 men and women of the Labor's International Union of North America. Uh, look at the, the natural gas, oil, the energy sector for us is thriving, along with, I know one of my brothers from the UA is here, operating engineers, uh, and the Teamsters who are for the building trades pipeline crafts. Um, and we have seen, you don't want to use the explosion when you're talking about natural gas, uh, but that's what we have seen uh, in our organization and in the industry. Um, you know, these kind of energy jobs are a pathway to the middle class. They provide hope, opportunity, good wages uh, with good benefits. Um, and that's what we stand for, and that's what the partnership with API in this sector actually provides. I do have a few examples, I couldn't memorize them all, but just to give an example of not only the potential, but then I'll talk just for a minute about some of the, some of the challenges. Uh, we have the Atlantic Coast pipe, Pipeline, or Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, I had over 1,600 laborers on that job, and I'm not talking about for a week or a month, I'm talking about a year or more. For over 4,500 building trades men and women, rover pipeline, over 3,000 construction workers, uh, multiple year project. Uh, Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline, 2,500. Line 3 replacement in Minnesota, 3,000. Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which is, has its challenges, which I'll talk about in a second, um, there is going to be about 1,200 construction laborers on it. And we actually have, one of, I saw one of the representatives that's here from Western Pennsylvania. There's a cracker plant there that has 7,500 construction workers uh, on that facility. So the potential is incredible. Um, and as I said, we've seen an absolute 
you know, thriving the energy sector in our organization, oil, gas. We also support wind, solar. We're doing a big nuclear uh, facility in Georgia. Well, what are some of the challenges? Um, I'm at least encouraged that on Thursday, I know the president is going to propose changes to NEPA, which are desperately needed from our perspective to expedite the permitting process and the environmental review process. Uh, we talk about with, you know, infrastructure, we want as much money for infrastructure as we can possibly get. Uh, but when infrastructure projects and energy projects uh, take 10 years, 12 years, I can, I'm not going to go through the list of them, but I have a project in Taos, New Mexico, an air, airport project, over 20 years to get the approval uh, for a runway expansion. Um, another project where it's a roadway with a bridge, uh, 16 years through the process, the review uh, the regulation process. And here, those of you that are from the, uh, the D.C. area, we have the Purple Line. Mm -hmm. Now, some of it was litigation, but it took 14 years for that to finally get off the ground. So NEPA needs to be changed. It needs, it's a 50-year-old regulation that needs changes to it. We still need to be thoughtful about environmental impact. That's not to rush it through uh, to harm the environment or workers, but it needs to be changed. And um, we have too many gutless politicians uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and across the country that are pandering to extremists uh, on all fronts who are licking their fingers and seeing which way the winds are, political winds are blowing instead of talking with us in the, in the sector, business, labor, suppliers, and the like to figure out how we move our energy policy forward in a way that we don't have the Keystone XL pipelines. We don't have the Penn East or the Atlantic Coast pipeline where it's on again, off again because of political whims. So between changes to NEPA, um, having politicians that actually start standing up instead of licking their fingers, um, and some other things, I think that we're just scratching the surface of this energy renaissance. It's good for business, it's good for the economy, and it's good for working men and women uh, that all they want to do is be able to keep a roof over their head, food on their table, and provide for themselves and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. You bring up um, an important point about infrastructure investment. I think a recent study um, has indicated that we need more than a trillion dollars in investment in infrastructure in order to keep up with growing um, global energy demand, so uh, cri critical. My next question um, is for you, Mike, our celebrity uh, guest. You've spent um, a lot of time on the front lines talking to American workers, hearing their stories, retelling their stories on your broadcasts, including spending time with workers in our industry. And as you know, they're very, very proud, um, not only of what they do every day, but in terms of what we've been able to achieve and, um, with regard to this new um, American energy leadership age. And so, uh, you know, my question for you is, how do we tell that, that story of progress and bring that pride that, that our workers feel about what we've accomplished in our industry outside of our industry to the rest of the American workforce? Yeah. Thank you for having me here for the uh, celebrity opinion. Um, look, for what it's worth, I, I have opinions. I have opinions about the infrastructure and about organized labor and about the widening skills gap and unemployment and all these things, but nobody would have ever given me a seat at any table or on any panel if, if we hadn't found a way to build a platform from which to share those ideas. And for me, that platform was a show called Dirty Jobs. And I spent 10 years crawling through sewers and doing unspeakable things to barnyard animals in an attempt to get the audience's attention. And once we did that, we, we got a weird level of permission to talk really honestly and really candidly about the evolving ever-changing definition of what a good job means back in the day. That was 2003. Today in 2020, we're still doing the same thing. We're, we're trying to make a persuasive case for opportunities that actually exist. Dirty Jobs gave me a chance to do a lot of different things, but the thing I'm most proud of in 2008 was the evolution of a foundation called MicroWorks. And the goal of MicroWorks, to your point, is to 
tell the stories of people who managed to prosper by mastering a trade and learning a skill that was actually in demand. So for the last 10 years or so, 12 years now, we've been offering work ethic scholarships, modest stipends to, in many cases, people who want to get into the energy industry. Because make no mistake, the, the biggest impediment to the growth that I think we all want to see has to do with the broader perceptions and the stigmas and the stereotypes and the misperceptions that affirmatively keep parents and guidance counselors from encouraging their kids to enter into that sector of work that, as my grandfather said, looks like work, <laughs> right? I mean, we're still, we're still lending money we don't have to kids who are never going to be able to pay it back to train them for jobs that don't actually exist anymore. And we're still tacitly promising that the value of a four-year degree is somehow going to translate into a magic ticket. And kids are still under the mistaken assumption that the odds are in their favor that they're going to find their dream job in their chosen major when they get out. And so there's been a giant reckoning. And the, the consequences of that reckoning, in my view, are nothing short of national security. We have $1.6 trillion in student loans currently on the books. We often talk about what a burden that is for the kids who hold that note, and it surely is, but hello, we hold the note too. $1.6 trillion, we're still telling kids the best path for the most people is the most expensive path. Meanwhile, we have 7.3 million open jobs in the skills gap, many of which are in your industry, many of which don't require a four-year degree. But for whatever reason, we've got it in our heads that those jobs are in some way subordinate. They've become vocational consolation prizes. So that's a long way of saying part of what you have to do is change the conversation. Part of what you have to do is educate 330 million people, not just about the opportunities in your industry, but the reality of their dependence on your product. We are profoundly disconnected, I'm afraid, in so many ways. That was a big lesson in Dirty Jobs. We were able to, we were able to reconnect people to the miracle of electricity coming on when you flick the switch or the equally miraculous occurrence when you flush the toilet and everything goes where it's supposed to go. These are miracles, and the people who make those miracles happen were the heroes of our show. So the short version is you have to educate, you have to inform, you have to fight them on the policy level, Terry, you're absolutely right. But we also have to, in a very Sisyphean way, or maybe quixotic, push the boulder up the hill. We have to change the conversation about the definition of a good job and tackle the misperceptions head on. If half the country comes to the conclusion that it's all over in 12 years, well then, none of these ideas and policies are ever gonna work. So, it's a very, very broad way of saying you have to get the country's attention and then persuade them and the way you persuade them, in my view, is not just to preach to the choir and not merely to confront those who are uniformly opposed, but to talk to the folks in the middle in a persuasive, compelling way that ultimately leads them to understand, look, this is a, this is a human condition, right? We wind, up, we wind up resenting that which we come to depend upon. It's crazy, but we do it all the time. I live in Northern California. Two months ago, we were without power for four days. I finally started to have conversations with my neighbors about the reality of the situation. But sometimes things have to go splat, right? Lose your power for four days, the conversation changes. Nobody wants to see that happen again, but we have to change the narrative. Hard work, but necessary work. Okay, I want to come back to skilled labor here in a minute, but, but before I do, I want to get Leslie um, in on the conversation here. You represent companies that supply critical equipment and services to the natural gas and oil industry all around the world. Right. Um, 
How does your industry think about recent policy proposals that would ban hydraulic fracturing, that would limit access to federal and state lands for exploration and development? Um, how does your industry respond to that? But also, you know, what do you think, how does that affect the American consumer? So thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate being able to represent Oldfield Services, critical part of the industry. Um, you know, Mike touched on it in his opening remarks. Um, we talk about a fracking ban, and I think it's important for all of us to recognize, you know, it's not just at the national level um, that we're seeing these threats. Certainly at the state level uh, in New York, you see outright ban, California, moratorium on new permitting, Colorado pushing regulatory um, activities out to the local level. Um, so we have to keep an eye on that, and then simultaneously, um, with the discussion around the fracking bans, you know, you see two candidates right now calling for an outright ban on the first day um, that they're elected, and, and the others pretty much saying that they would attempt uh, to ban on federal lands. I think the political reality of that is that a president could likely um, enact a fracking ban on federal public lands, but most of that unconventional activity occurs on private lands. And so, what that would look like most likely is just a regulatory creep and the administration, um, this administration by a motivated president could take actions through the Clean Air, Clean Water Act um, to eventually kind of create a de facto ban. Um, you know, that would require congressional action, of course, and that we wouldn't likely see that unless the Senate um, were to flip. Um, but we already talked about what fracking has given um, to the industry, I mean, how it's changed our geopolitical position, how it's um, bolstered our economy, and also reduced emissions, you know, at the same time that we had all this production growth, we also reduced emissions. So to pull off a technology um, that has given us all of this is, is knee-jerk and wouldn't even get to the heart um, of, of the goal. And I think we've seen the recent study by the Chamber kind of talk about you know, what we would lose at the economic level, um, you know, gasoline prices double, electricity prices quadruple. Um, geopolitically, we return to our reliance on the Middle East. You know, that's pretty scary, especially this week. Um, you know, we change our trade deficit. You know, we're in a great position. And most importantly then, that emissions, the emissions would go up because of the market share that natural gas has taken over coal. Um, what we have to do, it all is going to get back to the technology and the innovation. Um, so many companies are investing in carbon capture, sequestration, many companies, oil field service companies, operators, IOCs, we're all investing in collaboration with renewable technologies. Um, again, the oil field service companies that are really energy technology companies are investing in water recycling and reuse. Um, automation, you know, AI in the oil field is real. And like Karen said, you know, that opens up the energy industry to a new workforce. You know, the fracking is not the dirty job um, that it used to be. Um, there are technologies being developed that are going to continue to make sure that the U.S. can keep our, our position that we've gained through, to, through all of the shale revolution, but also, you know, really be able to allow us to attract a new workforce that's going to keep us there. Back to the technology and innovation. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. I want to spend a, a, just another minute on inno innovation. As you mentioned, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling are innovations that have completely changed the energy complexion, right. not only here domestically, but globally. And on the horizon, there are new technologies in the pipeline. You mentioned carbon capture, but there are additional abatement. Um, technologies in the pipeline to fight the risks of climate change, um, energy storage, um, remote uh, technology, chemical recycling of petroleum products. How do you see sort of the, pol you know, the policy space affecting that kind of innovation? What kinds of policies, what kinds of atmospheres do we need politically in order to enable this industry to continue to innovate and problem solve for the future? Do you mean to start sure. with that? I, I think first and foremost, you know, the, this is uniquely American. That horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, marrying that up, that was a uniquely American technology. And as we continue to develop that out, we export technologies, you know, so it has to be trade, 
right now, you know, trade and tariffs, I mean, they're just impacting the industry in such a significant way, um, specifically in oil field services. You know, we have to have a clear vision of what we can import and export, and some of that is equipment with high tech, and some of it is specific technology. So I think, first and foremost, um, at the policy level, it is focusing on free trade, and policies will support it. Karen, do you have a do you have a perspective on what can really drive innovation? You know, representing entrepreneurs and these small businesses that you know really jump into these niche um, spaces. What what do you see in the policy space to really drive innovation? Well, obviously, we need <clears throat> trade is very very important. Um, I think you know changes on the regulatory front, permitting all that. Um, I mean, certainly from a, a tax perspective, I mean, giving. Um, entrepreneurs the opportunity to hold on to more of their capital and more of their resources as they can invest um, in innovation um, is, is, is really critical. So um, continuous policy improvement, you know, on all these fronts, I mean, again, going back to trade, you know, having uh, market access, you know, like create more growth, more innovation, more efficiency, I mean, it's, all a, it's all a beautiful circle, you know, mm -hmm. if you will. But also, you know, we talked about diversification. You know, we need, um, when you look at entrepreneurship and new business creation, we still haven't recovered from the rates of business creation um, from the Great Recession, right? And so a lot of the new business creation and the entrepreneurship, you know, is happening, it's very concentrated in, um, in urban areas. And uh, so, um, but, you know, where do we see the opportunity, you know, with energy? It happens to be in rural America. It happens to be in exurban areas. And, um, you know, just, I think, again, allowing development to continue, um, you know, not having these bans is very critical to getting more minds and people involved in the energy sector in these regions. Um, and that fuels innovation, right? Beyond the policies, um, you know, just, again, the diversity of people, um, you know, bringing in the opportunity, again, you know, to rural, you know, America, um, is not only critical for economic development and hope um, and all of that, but um, will fuel the innovation and the use of current technologies, whether it's robotics, artificial intelligence, um, 3D printing. Um, you know, the, the sky's the limit, you know, in terms of technology, and we never know where that next technological innovation will come from. Um, and so, again, the policies have to continue to fuel investment, because these are long-term investments. Mm -hmm. So stability, I think, on every, every front uh, in certainty is, is very critical. Okay, I want to come back to the skilled labor um, issue that Mike so eloquently and passionately expressed earlier. And Terry, you know, talk to you about what do you see as impediments to, you know, skilled labor, of course, is critical to this industry. It will be moving forward in the, into the future. What do you see as um, impediments and also priorities and opportunities to really um, expand and make sure that, that, that the skilled labor force is there for years to come as we continue to innovate and grow? I think Mike talk, touched on something that is critically important. That is, is that if you're out recruiting young men and women or returning veterans, which is a big source of, of recruiting for us, uh, and, and at the end of the day, if you think that natural gas is going to go away in 10 years, what's the incentive to pick that um, a, as, a, as a career path? Um, so I, I, I know I harp on the political innovation along with industry innovation um, and the innovation of how we convince young men and women or middle-aged individuals that are looking for a career that the energy sector is a vibrant and thriving area and one that we need to encourage more people to come to instead of going away. Mm -hmm. So I still do think that one of the impediments is, is that, is that job going to be around? Will I be able to make a career out of it? Well, you should be able to not only make a career, but retire mm -hmm. it as a career mm -hmm. with the amount of work opportunities that are out there in this thriving sector. And so I think whether it's education piece with parents and, and with individuals that are not bound for college or maybe went to college and figured out maybe this isn't for me and are looking for a career change. We have to bundle it all together, but, but policy plays a role. Because I think that the nonsense that's going on in Capitol Hill, Green, Green New Deal and some of these other things with all due respect, 
chase people away instead of attract them mm -hmm. because they think that at the end of the day, I'm going to go through training, I'm going to start off in this sector, and 10 years from now, they're telling me they're going to pull the plug on it. Thanks, Terry. Backstage, um, Leslie and Kara, we were talking a little bit about diversity in this industry and how this industry brings more diverse points of view and experiences into the workplace. Do you want to talk a little bit about your, you know, what, what you've seen in that area how, um, and, and future opportunities you see to make this industry um, ha have more di diverse viewpoints represented among our employees? Sure. I think as the energy evolves and grows and, and we, you know, look forward to getting more diverse um, viewpoints, we really um, will just we'll be able to attract the, the thinkers that we need to get through to these challenges. So the technologies that we talked about, the ways that we need to move closer to a lower, car lower carbon future, um, diverse thinking at the heads of those um, groups that are going to be leading that charge is only going to benefit. Um, you know, we've seen studies that show um, even market share gains and productivity gains. There's no question that a more diverse leadership at any given company is going to help it. But for us, for the energy industry specifically, um, we have got to be able to have policies within our companies that will attract more, a more diverse workforce. Um, we're moving towards that. We see them. Um, but we really have to be focused on that um, and to support our workforce that, that's going to really drive that innovation and change. Great. Okay. I think we have some time, and my colleague Bill Kotzel um, is going to be moderating some questions um, for us from the audience. I think you've had an opportunity maybe to, uh, okay, great. Bill's got him. He's ready. All right. Bill, take it away. Let me ask, we've had a lot of questions. Thanks for everybody. A lot of questions following up on, on how you attract folks into the skilled labor. But one specific one that came up several times is how do you square this move towards artificial intelligence and automation with the increasing need for, mm. for craftsmen. Mm. Mike, you wanna, you wanna take a crack at that one? You said AI? Yeah, you know, it, it's sort of, you have this dichotomy, you're moving toward more automation, but at the same time you need more skilled labor, and how do you convince folks that, that you need both at the same time? Well, in my world, when somebody says AI, the first thing I think of is an artificial intelligence. But that's another story. <laughs> We're not here to talk about the other thing. The, uh, the reality is, I mean, for me, not a day goes by when somebody doesn't ask if the robots are coming to take our jobs. It's a, you know, it's a very simplistic but very real fear, and a lot of people have it. And it's easy to, well, it's easy to dismiss it if you look back at, at history. I mean, it's never happened. You know, the Luddite revolution was based, as I remember, basically with the loomers, right? I mean, it were, there was absolute certainty that the jobs were going to vanish as a result of this existential thing. They're always displaced. They always move, but they never, they never truly, truly vanish. And look, I, it, I'm way ahead of my skis on this. I don't know. I suspect... I suspect we'll all live to see self-driving vehicles, but I don't know that we'll live to see trucks going down the road without a driver behind the steering wheel anyway. Might not be touching it, but it's hard to imagine, you know, we're going to see that, that happen. We might, but if it does, surely things will have been reconfigured once again and new opportunities that we can't currently conceive of will arise. It's always, always, always happened that way. Yeah. Terry, do you have a perspective um, on this uh, issue? I mean, we can't get in the way, nor should we, of innovation, automation. I know that through training, which we're a big proponent, as the other trades are, um, in training and retraining of our members, um, is how we take advantage of automation. I, I agree with Mike that there's, going to be, there's still going to be jobs. There may be fewer jobs. But if we can change the dynamics of the energy industry, we'll create more jobs. Um, and so it's, I think it's about being nimble. It's about being understanding that things are going to change, embracing change, training for change, uh, and trying to build this out and up because there's enough of potential in the energy sector, I think, that as automation takes some 
jobs, there'll be other job opportunities. And if we can train workers for that, they can take advantage of it and still stay in the energy sector. Yeah. And Great. I'll, I'll just yeah, add in ahead. those workers, I mean, that is a diverse group of workers that can take those jobs. It's a different kind of worker that was traditionally in the oil field. Yeah. And so that's the whole point, you know, to be able to put those workers in. And some of these new technologies take workers out of harm's way um, by use yeah. of, of technology. So really it's an, it's an opportunity for skilled labor in some ways. Bill, do you have um, another question for us? Sure do. Um, I wonder if the, there were a lot of questions for the, for the panel about looking back in time uh, before the United States was uh, exporting oil and gas to the time maybe a decade ago and what that looked like for suppliers and labor and small businesses across the country and, and what it might look like if we went back to a time where we were in a more volatile situation. Terry, you want to kick us off? I can so tell. I You're ready. I was having a tough time hearing the question. Oh, um, the, so, so Bill, correct me um, if, I'm, if I'm wrong. The question was, if we rewind and go back to a time where um, America ha doesn't have this kind of energy independence anymore, where um, energy pr there's more volatility in the market um, because of policy proposals or otherwise, what does that look like for the organizations that and the individuals that you represent? If we were to rewind and go back um, to the atmospherics 10 years ago, you know, what does that do to your constituencies? So in our organization, you know, heavy and highway is the number one sector, energy is number two, and building is number three. If you, un if you unplug energy, it would have a dramatic impact on our organization. More importantly, it would have a devastating impact on the, pr on, on the men and women that we proudly represent. Uh, it would turn their lives upside down. Uh, at a time when they finally have hope and opportunity or making really good money and have great benefits, uh, that, that would dis disappear. And given until we change our, our way of expediting projects on the infrastructure side, uh, if we wind it all the way back, they improve them a lot quicker. So, but today, not so. But it would, it would have a tremendous and devastating impact on the lives of the members that, that I represent and the other building trades unions that are here. It would turn them upside down. But who's got, who's got the most skin in the game in terms of, you know, a critical mass? The fat part of the bat is 330 million Americans. And we don't have to imagine what the past looks like. We, it's 1973. <laughs> We're in line. The lines, for, the lines at the pump are miles long. We have a whole generation alive today that has no recollection of that. So from a perception standpoint, and again, perception shapes reality. Perception, I believe, informs policy. Uh, I think it would be a terrific idea to remind the country in crisp, clear, stark imagery of exactly what the past looked like when we were utterly reliant on energy from other places. Yeah. And that, it's, it's, we're preaching to the choir. We understand for the workers in this industry, this thing would have a horrible consequence. But the rest of the country, they're just so busy. You know, you've got to get them someplace mm -hmm. where they really and truly live, like the gas pump, or their heating, or their air conditioning, or any of the other things, right, mm -hmm. that we take for granted. That's my message. It's, Yep. And, I, and I'm repeating myself, mm -hmm. but if, if you don't engage the people outside of the industry, mm -hmm. then we're just talking to panels. To ourselves, you know? exactly right. Okay, Bill, maybe one more question? Well, let me do one and see if we can sneak one more in. Okay. Leslie and Karen, we have a question specifically for you to talk about some of your members. There's this perception that the oil and gas industry is full of huge behemoth companies, uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about uh, your members the size of your members, the jobs that this industry supports. Go ahead, Karen. That's, me. That's for you. Um, yeah, I mean, when among so many U.S. industries, whether it's you know oil and natural gas or some of the other you know bigger um, some of the other industries, um, well, all the industries in this country, I mean, they are dominated by small to mid-sized businesses, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial firms. 
And uh, so it's a misconception. Um, you know, we're up on the hill and obviously communicating um, the numbers, the data, uh, in terms of some of the some of the data that I highlighted uh, in my in my first remarks about the dominance of small businesses in every sector of the energy industry, if not all you know industries that come under attack from a policy perspective, up on Capitol Hill or in the state capitals um, or at the local level. So, um, and, and as I said, the, the innovation um, in, in, in any industry, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's uh, in the uh, oil and natural gas industry, comes from entrepreneurial small firms. And when there's any type of, um, uh, you know, a, a barrier, um, big barriers that are, that are placed up, I mean, it really hurts innovation, hurts access to capital, and you need capital and you need investment in order to fuel innovation. Um, but for businesses that are not, um, you know, in this sector, when you talk about a rewind, you didn't have to go back to the 70s, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, when we had some of these price shocks at the pump, where our members had to take pretty dramatic actions in terms of, you know, cutting back some of their employees, employee hours, um, you know, doing a lot, uh, it just, you know, as a business becoming less competitive because they couldn't, their capital was going, you know, into paying for those higher prices and it happened rather quickly as opposed to going, you know, being able to go into their business, compete and um, hire new people um, and invest for growth. So um, whether you're a small business that's a consumer, you know, of, en of, 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 of energy or someone that's very engaged and involved in this sector, um, it's, it's really all about small business uh, and entrepreneurs. And, and obviously, you know, the hardworking people who work for these enterprises uh, as well. And they are the generator of job creation, um, innovation, and I just love it that, um, particularly in these areas of the country that have been left behind, that uh, energy development uh, and production has been the catalyst, you know, to economic development and new hope and vibrant communities um, now, uh, again, particularly in the areas of the country that needed it the most. So um, I think I covered a lot of ground there on small business, but uh, again, it's, it's an industry that's all about small business, and as consumers, boy, I tell you, from a competitive perspective, the cost of, of energy is really critical. Okay, really, really this time, one more. Really quick. I just wanted to let Mike know, I think you have a future producer here in the audience. They want to know if you'd be interested in doing an energy job series to tell the stories of the men and women of this oh, industry. So. Tell me where to be. In. <laughs> well, I'll be there. No, look, I mean, it's, uh, I think, I think that a lot of the country would really dig a show, a, a dirty jobs type show that was focused specifically on the industry. But I also think, I also think you have to be even broader than that. I mean, I've, we're working on a project right now that's about as broad as can be. It's a, it's a celebration of surprising connections. In fact, there was a show called Connections back in the 70s with a guy named James Burke. He was terrific. This is a version of that show where we build chains consisting of links between two seemingly completely disparate points. And along the way, you discover that everything is, in fact, connected, and those connections are only made possible, inevitably, by the presence of energy. So years ago, I did a show called How Booze Built America, where I took a somewhat uh, unorthodox position with history and argued that every major decision that had ever impacted our country uh, was made with booze in the room. And, and it holds up. Well, you can also make the case a whole lot easier that uh, energy is always, always in the room. You know, whether you're in the industry or not, whether you're in policy or not, whether you're rep, it, it, it doesn't matter. Every single American is reliant on this. So you're right, some type of show should absolutely positively come to pass. And if there is anyone in the room who would like to help me make that happen, well then. <laughs> or contribute financially. Consider that the hard sell. <laughs> All right, great ideas coming from the audience. Thank you all very much. So with that, I'm gonna draw our panel to a conclusion. 
I hope you'll join me in thanking this very excellent group of folks who have volunteered their time to spend with us this afternoon. We very much appreciate your insights around the future of energy in America. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. And now we leave. I'll follow you. Okay. <laughs>